Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're on the range with the new Strybog SP9A3. And what does that mean? Well, for the most part, not a whole lot externally and even internally with one big exception. This gun is roller delayed. So the previous versions of this firearm were just directly blowback. This one has a roller delay system in it that's nothing like an HK system. We'll break this down and show you what it looks like. It's very simple as compared to the HKs actually. And it does seem, at least in our shooting, that it has a slight, very slight advantage in terms of recoil reduction that we can tell. But we're gonna get into this gun, talk a little bit about it. We're not gonna rehash everything that we've already covered in our previous two SP9 videos. Suffice it to say, the problems that I found in the other videos persist with the new A3. This is not a new gun. There's, people think that this is a brand new gun just because it just hit the US market. It's been on sale for over three years in the European market, and so it's a fully developed product. They just took years trying to get the ATF to approve this gun, even though it's really not that much different than the guns they've already approved for import. That's why they're so late to the game here in the United States. But we'll talk more about that here in a few minutes. When we're done with this video, we're gonna take this gun over and start our brand new PCC gauntlet tests, and this will be our first contestant. So stick around for that in the next video that follows this one. On top, we have the new Vortex AMG UH-1 Huey red dot sight. So this is the second generation of the sight. We'll make a few comments about it in this video. And uh, we'll probably talk more about that one later. On it, I have a SP Tactical side folding brace, which is an option that adds money to the cost of the overall gun. All right, so let's start shooting. And I've been shooting this gun already with 115 and 124 grain Federal. Now, again, the gun does have some of the quirks, some of the problems I think are design flaws that the previous generation guns have, and we'll briefly touch upon that here in this video. So we're not gonna be shooting full mags or not that many, simply because of the ammo crunch of 2020. We're running short on ammo and getting resupplied is very difficult. We can't even find it online for sale. So we're gonna have to slow down our ammo consumption. So let's start this party with the challenge target plate rack. All right, so those are 115 grain rounds, and those do come from our friends over at Federal. They support us here at the channel by supplying the ammunition for free of charge. Now, you'll notice I'll keep reaching up, tightening this thread protector. That's because it'll walk itself loose over and over again. One more mag dump here really quick for you guys so you can get an idea of the gun working. Watch that recoil impulse. And malfunction. Aha, stovepipe. That's the first stovepipe I've had with the gun. Interesting. Now, let's see, well, I'm gonna demonstrate, I think, a design flaw with the gun that we've had uh, noted in the past. If I hold the weapon up like this, try to kick that out, you would, now people will critique this and say, that's not how you clear the weapon, roll it over. But with other firearms, with AR-15s, you'll see us clearing them like this because it'll still throw that malfunction case out, holding the gun slightly sideways with the muzzle up. In this case, that brass casing just got in to the, uh, the action and it popped another round out of the magazine. And if I go to let the bolt go home, it's just gonna malfunction. So now I have to take the magazine out, lose a round. I have a spent case in there. I think I finally, yeah, I shook it out. So the spent case can still fall behind the bolt. All right, so that was literally a first malfunction at about 300 rounds. All right, and I've primarily been using the older magazines. The new one, uh, new mags have these steel reinforcements. All right, so let's take a little bit closer look at the new A3. We would like to thank our friends at Big Daddy Unlimited for helping to make this and other videos possible. If you'd like to help us out, swing by the BDU website, and just for 99 cents, you can try out their service for one month. And they're basically like the Sam's Club of the online world. So check them out. If you would like to stay a member, go by militaryarms.org. There's a big link right at the top of the website, and you can stay a member for 20% off every month going forward. So please check them out. Myself and other YouTubers and bloggers have already talked ad nauseum about the SP9A1. So the SP9A3 not being that much different, I'm not gonna get into a whole lot of time here talking about features you're probably already aware of. But you have the option, of course, of putting an SP Tactical Brace on them. They still have their flip-up sights. 
which are plastic. You have a V-notch rear uh, low and a blade up here, or you can flip it up and have an aperture with a front post as well. You have pretty much full ambient control. So you have select lever on both sides of the gun, both sides of the gun. Mag release right here by my index finger, bolt release right here by my index finger. You push down on the sheet metal tab, easy to get to, and those controls are mirrored on the other side of the firearm. There's your bolt release, magazine release. Charging handle can be reversed. You can't have two charging handles at a, in it at a time, so if you want to charge it from the left-hand side, uh, that's great. If you want to move it to the right-hand side, you can do that during disassembly. Very easily done. But it has a non-reciprocating charging handle, so when that bolt is to the rear, you'll notice that the charging handle moves independently. So you can fire this with a C-clamp, and you're not going to have the um, charging handle hit you in the hand and cause a malfunction. Out on the end, we have a thread protector and a, a half by 28 thread for suppression. All right, still uses the older magazines or you can use the newer ones, that hasn't changed. So now let's take a look inside the gun. Magazine out, bolt locked the rear, chamber's clearly empty. I'm gonna go ahead and let that bolt go home. Push this rear take pin, take down pin out. And just like I mentioned in previous videos, there's no need to take that first push pin out, but you can, but if you do, the bolt release comes loose as well. To take the brace or end cap off, just push down a little bit and it'll pop right off. I'll pull back on the charging handle, get a hold of the recoil system, recoil spring and buffer. Let that bolt come back further and this is where we're gonna see that roller delay system. So this is your roller delay system. See that little piece moving right there? So under, when it's locked, the pressure of the cartridge is gonna push rearward on this bolt and that'll eventually push this little roller up, which will draw in this front piece, which engages with the charging handle, and that will unlock the pistol. So this roller's down in the locked position, it's pushing back, the forces of recoil are pushing back on that. It'll push up on this little pin, retract this piece, and now the bolt's free to move to the rear. Very simple and elegant design. Taking it apart, I mean, it just comes right apart. Now, one of the things you're gonna notice right away if you have one of the earlier generation guns is that the bolt from an earlier generation gun, this is SP9A1 with a non-reciprocating charging handle, the bolt mass is significantly reduced with the A3 over the A1. You'll also notice on this earlier A1 that it has a multi-part recoil buffering system here. You have a piece of metal, then pieces of silicone on either side, recoil spring, and then you have this rod here and this rod in this gun fills the void where malfunctions like I showed you in the opening of the video occur. That rod prevents spent cases and live rounds from falling back into the action of the gun and causing a malfunction. That rod has been unfortunately removed from this particular design. But the biggest note is you're giving up a lot of bolt mass with this roller delay system, which lends itself to the perception of a lower, milder recoil impulse. So there is a not notable difference, at least both Jason and I agree upon that. Unfortunately, because I know you're going to ask, can you take this system out and put it in this gun? The answer is no, it will not fit. So I'm sure if you're uh, mechanically inclined, you could, you know, manufacture something with this and make it work, but I'm not. Generally speaking, no, it's not going to work. Putting it back together, just put this piece in. You'll have this little cam slot that the pin rides in. Put that facing down, drop your pin in. Because the pin kind of moves around freely. You'll want to invert the gun and make it a little bit simpler so the pin doesn't fall out and make reassembly more difficult. Slide your bolt in, recoil buffer, and spring. And those are the biggest mechanical differences between the A3 and the A1 that came in before it. Here's some 115 grain Federal. Mm -hmm. 
This is one of the earlier magazines, and this is loaded again with 115 grain Federal. I don't know what's going on. I've oiled it. I haven't shot it that much since I last cleaned it. But it's definitely having failures. Now, this is perfectly set up again for the, the spent case and maybe even a live round falling back into the chamber. To avoid that, rotate the gun completely on its side and kind of nose down a little bit. And it should uh, resolve your malfunction. So doing the AR-15 style clearing, you're gonna be better off pointing the muzzle down and the gun on its side to clear it. Otherwise, if you do this on its side, it can fall back into the action of the gun. All right, but that was with its older magazine. Supposedly the new ones are improved, but we had a stovepipe even with one of the new ones. I just realized something, guys. Most of the shooting I've been doing with the gun before filming this afternoon has actually been with 124 grain Federal. I've only fired a few rounds of the 115 grain just to check zero before, uh, before filming this segment. So. We've loaded some 124 grain ammunition into one of the older magazines and one of the newer magazines. And let's see if these malfunctions persist because actually it, it's rather surprising given how much I've already shot the gun and not had that many malfunctions with it. None actually until today. So yeah, I think it's gonna like the heavier 124 grain stuff, at least this particular version. Now I know that Mr. Guns and Gear did a video on these and he had a lot of functional issues. I don't know if he was using reloads or what, um, but I know he had a lot more issues than I'm having. Now he was also using some of the Syntex, which we used in some of the earlier guns we had a lot of functional issues with, which is one of the reasons why we're using Ball. Now I know that the owner of Grand Power, Jaro, has said that the guns were designed for the European market to shoot plus P plus nine millimeter. And they know that here in America, we don't shoot plus P, much less plus P plus. Plus P plus is almost impossible to find. Plus P is ridiculously expensive. And most of us shoot 115 grain or 124 grain ball in bulk pack because that's what we can get and not pay an arm and a leg to acquire it. So knowing that this gun was coming to the US market and having three years to prepare for that, knowing that we've already made note of these guns having problems in previous videos that they acknowledged, it seems odd that this gun would show up and still have issues with certain types of commercial ammunition. So I know when I had first posted my first video, which we had nothing but problems with, the Global Ordinance, the importer, released a statement saying that they were aware of the problems and they were going to uh, supply a lighter spring to resolve that problem. I don't know if those lighter springs were actually produced and sent out. And I don't know if that lighter spring is in this gun. So odd results to say the least, but I'm not having any issues with the 124 grain Federal. You might get this gun and find it's gonna be a little bit ammo specific. So one of the early problems that I discovered with the Strybog that I illustrated in my previous two videos was that the magazines have a tendency to bind up and they've not corrected that problem with the new generation magazine, which you see here with the steel reinforcements. Loading them can be beyond frustrating. Once you get to about 10 rounds loaded, it becomes actually painful to, to attempt to continue loading the magazine. It has a very heavy spring, but what's happening are the rounds are binding up inside the magazine as, as, as the rounds stack. Now it's requiring considerably more force to load. We're almost 20 rounds in. You can hear it just making like spring door sounds. Okay, 
30 rounds loaded. Now, sometimes when I go to unload it manually, you'll see how slow the magazine, I'm bleeding, the, the slow, look how slow the magazine is to push the round up. See what's doing there? Now this could cause functional issues with the gun. Now, it may get the magazine to feed as the gun jars under recoil, but this is not normal behavior for a standard double stack magazine. Okay, not normal. And that can will ultimately manifest in malfunctions, especially if you try to fire the gun too quickly. <laughs> I mean, actually, <laughs> I guess this is the plus. It does make it easier to unload because it puts that round straight up for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's one benefit, I guess, to the magazines. All right, well, anyway, you get the idea. The magazines are a hot mess. Now, what you can do is what I recommended, I believe, in my second video, and that's spray oil in your magazine. Now, you shouldn't have to do that to a polymer magazine. You shouldn't have to do that to a magazine at all. But if you spray oil into them, they become infinitely easier to load, and thus it should improve reliability. And I'm not kidding how much of a difference it makes. Just firing a little bit of oil down into the magazine, lubricating it, all those grindy spring noise sounds, stuff like that go away, and the magazine loads as any other magazine would. But you should not have to lubricate magazines. I don't lubricate the magazines of any of my other guns, and to me that tells me there's a design problem, an engineering problem with the design of the magazine itself. But I think I've made my point, loading the magazine after lubrication is like it should be. Also, when you go to pop them out, it's still slow to feed them out. As you can see, and this is, again, this is a lubricated magazine. It's still slow to pop them out. And there's very little pressure on the feed lips. Okay, again, bad magazines. We have two and two, two magazines of 115 grain ball and two magazines of 124 grain ball. I'm pretty sure I just loaded 124. Let me look at that bullet profile. Yeah, I think these are the 124s and the next two magazines will be 115s. All right, let's move over to the 115 Federals. And perfect function that time around with the 115s and 124s. We're back up on the hill on the rifle range and we're gonna take some shots with the uh, SP9A3 out to range, but I just wanted to comment on the Vortec UH1 Gen 2. The only complaint I have with this one right now is that after a few hundred rounds, it seems like I'm constantly readjusting it because I'll, if I move or push on the sight, it'll start moving back and forth on the 1913 rail, and I keep having to tension it. Hopefully, I've gotten it tight enough now where it won't shoot loose, but it's already shot lo loose twice after I thought I had it tight but I'm just gonna confirm zero here really quick. And while I was out here shooting the other day, I was actually getting hits all the way out to 300 yards with this. And hopefully this thing is still sighted into the point where I can get some hits maybe out at 200. Let's try that first. You hear that? That was 200 yards, guys. <laughs> Another hit. Oh, missed that one. Another score. Now these are the 124s. The 250 yard guy is way up in the weeds, kind of hard to see. No. 
Ooh, I hit off to the right of him. I saw it. A hit at 250 yards, guys. <laughs> oh, this is so hard to see that guy. Another hit, 250 yards. At 100, really easy. So the UH-1 has a uh, dual reticle. So you have a dot in the center. You have an EOTech style circle around the dot. Then on the very bottom, you have a triangular chevron. And what I'm using is that chevron to get myself out to range, even with a nine millimeter carbine. Well, actually it's a PCC with a brace on it, but you get my point. Let's see if we can go to 200 again. So at 200, I'm just holding it between the chevron and the red dot. I went off this right edge. and scored a hit all the way out there. Another hit. Another solid hit. Yep, so I'm easily able to hit 200 yards with this bad boy using the, uh, the Huey. Pretty darn cool. Just missed one. So, what do I think of the gun? Well, if you could get it at its regular price point of right around $700, if I'm not mistaken, uh, these were under $800 originally uh, with the blowback versions. Uh, it's really hard to find these right now. They're coming in the country, but they get snapped up fairly quickly. You can find them on places like Gunbroker, but people are paying up to $1,200 to $1,400 for them. They are not worth that. So don't be tempted by panic buying prices. If you can find one for its actual retail price, yeah, they seem to be a de decent gun. It has its quirks. So just know that you're going to probably want to lube the, put some lube in the magazine and run the hotter ammunition that you have. So in this case, this gun likes 124 grain rounds and seems to stumble every once in a while with the 115 grains. So look for range ammunition that's warm enough to keep the gun running reliably and you shouldn't have any problems there. And the only other quirk is if you have to clear a malfunction or if you want to empty the gun, here I have a loaded magazine. If I want to empty the gun, just make sure that when you do that, you don't hold it like an AR-15 with the muzzle up, because if you do, that round, it popped out that time, but that round can fall back into the action of the gun. Sometimes you can shake it out, other times you have to disassemble the gun to get it out, especially with a spent case. So, it is definitely a mild shooting 9mm, so that delay system seems to make a little bit of a difference. Again, we have less reciprocating mass, but I can't say I noticed a major difference. And overall, the quality of the gun seems to be fairly good. So anyway, if you guys have any questions, ask those questions down below. Also, please like and subscribe and share this video because that really helps us with the algorithms. And if you would like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, because we did purchase this firearm so we could give you unbiased information, please consider supporting us in our efforts to do that. And you can do that by becoming a Patreon supporter. There's a link in the video description down below. Swing by and check us out over on Patreon or right here on YouTube, right underneath the video player, there's a little join button. Click that join button and support us right here on YouTube. And it really does help us out and keeps us going because we rely on you, our viewing audience, for our revenue. And last but not least, guys, please swing by and check out coppercustom.com. Thank you for 12 years of support, and we'll talk to you guys soon.